Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Crypto Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Charles. Enjoy. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Crypto Entrepreneurs Podcast. As always, it's your host, Charles, and today we've got a great one for you. So today I'm going to be sitting down with Patrick Dugan to talk about Trade Layer, and then we're going to get into some startup do's and don'ts. But before we get into all of that, I do just want to give a special shout out to our two sponsors. The first is Roundly X. I've been using this service for like two months now, and I couldn't be happier. How it works is you link your credit and debit cards, and every time you make a purchase, they round it up to the next dollar and invest that spare change into Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency of your choosing. It's kind of like the acorns of crypto. It's very, you know, easy, hands-free, hands-off, kind of just continue on with your life and slowly accumulate if you haven't already there's a link in the description below head on over create an account link your cards and get started today the second is coinflex these guys are really starting to heat up you know they've got the normal stuff I've talked about it a bunch of times they've got some of the lowest if not the lowest fees in the market depending on how much flex you own you can now stake your flex and earn $10 USDT per thousand flex per month. And I think what everyone's been waiting for is these bracket order competitions. They have started. There was one last week. There's more this week. They're giving away $10,000 a day. I've been telling you guys to sign up forever. If you haven't yet, you are late to the game. Head on over now create an account, get ready for the next competition. On top of that, they allow you to create your own trading competitions and set your own parameters and keep a portion of the trading fees throughout your own competition. I'm going to be getting one started soon. We'll have all the details to you shortly. But until then, go sign up, create an account, get ready for these competitions. Now, let's talk to Patrick. Patrick, before we get into what you're doing in the industry, we talk about trade layer, we talk about startups, uh, can you just give us a little bit of background on yourself and what you were doing before you found cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so I always wanted to be a, a game designer since I was like seven or something like that. Uh, and I would design games back then. And I also... Uh, would write stories. So I, I went to school for uh, creative writing. I went to Virginia Tech. I graduated on a somewhat zany, macabre note early because, not because I was an overachiever, because I had, you know, sort of privileges coming up from the AP courses I took. And then um, there was a mass shooting, so I got to skip it. Um, so that's a funny fact about me. Um, I call it my uh, alma murder. Oh my god! <laughs> We're getting into the uh, crypto's depressing talk here. Well, I mean, it's it, you know it worked out for me because I wasn't there, and I um, and nobody that I knew uh, died. That's good to but, hear. But uh, the boyfriend of a friend of my ex girlfriend did die, Ooh. which is fucked up. Yeah, unfortunate. But out of the thirty three people, including the shooter. Um, and back then we all believed in Illuminati theories and we listened to like Alex Jones. And I, I went out and campaigned for Ron Paul. Okay. So like, I was like, wow, 33. Anyway. So then I went to Argentina, um, zanily enough as well, just turning it up. And, uh, Argentina is a crazy place. Um, that, that changed my life forever. Uh, and I got to work with an Argentine game company. Uh, and then I worked with some Harvard business school guys, boss who, uh, to learn about quantitative thought from the guy who founded Oscar Hell. Uh, and then I got to work with some other cool people uh, like Matt Jacobson, uh, who was a Facebook exec, and now he's like a VC guy. And 
uh, he taught me a few things and then I did a I got burned by a, a Kardashian video game that like didn't happen but I was gonna beat that up so I was like ah oh, Chris Jenner I'll never forgive you uh, and then I, I had to hear my wife explain to me like how actually it was like kind of re reasonable from Chris Jenner's perspective and I like I mean, like really broke it down and I was like okay fine it was the PR firm it wasn't Chris Jenner's fault you know we moved on but it took me uh until last week I I would still blame the Kardashians myself, but uh, that's you know, just me. Well, I appreciate your take on that. Um, I, the, you know, bros stand together. Um, but anyway, so I was a little burnt out of video games. I decided to make a permaculture game, which I did actually complete, called Make It Grow. Um, so I've done a lot of fucking shit. Yeah. <laughs> and I did I did a couple of video games before I went and like caved and got a, a full time job in 2008. Uh, I tried to do some casual games, but I. Like my problem with entrepreneurship, like the kind of underlying theme is I'm really shitty at managing people um, because I would just want to be everyone's friend. Yeah. I'm not, I, I don't have that kind of personality. Uh, like the startup I'm working in now, there's like a, a timesheet app and you got to submit the timesheets and, and it's like rigorous, you know, like it's, there's a certain systematic professionalism, you know, there's ticketing and everything. Um, and the CTO gens, the spreadsheet report of everyone's ticket status. So it's like, they know, you know, there's no like not doing stuff in the GitHub. I mean, it's, it's Unity Hub, but like same idea. Um, so I, I never like ran a startup with that level of rigor and that, that fucked me. Um, and I never pushed myself to, um, like I learned some code, I did some code in high school, I did some C++ tutorials. And then I started out in CS, but I dropped out um, because I wanted to design video games and I'm a wasteoid, you know, whatever. Uh, I didn't ha have the, the temerity to, uh, to execute in CS, and I, and I fucked myself for that, but also um, CS was a lot harder back then. So nowadays, it's, so I, eventually at, at age 29, after, um, you know, getting to do a game with Startup Chile, and then it was like, well, this is a cool permaculture game, but there's no product market fit. So, okay. And, and then I spent like a year trying to manually operate uh, an Amazon Fresh style e-commerce service, which was not, you know, it was like normie enough. <laughs> so it seemed like it was a good idea, but that wasn't that great. Uh, but I did discover Bitcoin in that time. I got robbed by, I have this like whole origin story. Um, you've probably heard it, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but there was a gun involved and in, in, uh, local Bitcoins. So, boom. And, and um, in that order, right, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then uh, I kind of I got involved with Omni, and then that that got basically defrauded, okay, by or program control fraud, uh, you could call it, or whatever. Let's not call it fraud. That sounds mean. I don't want to be a mean guy, uh, but let's say there was some money that like should have been funding payroll that it, like wasn't there and it stopped funding payroll. So. I volunteered and I got uh, voted onto the board and I did some tasks to try and plan how we would use the Omni that was left. Well, we had to rebrand it to Omni, so back then it was still MasterCoin. Uh, and I, I was doing a few other things. And then um, in the process of doing accounting, I discovered this hole in the balance sheet and uh, I shook it until coins came out um, like, like a bully kind of but it, but a courteous bully i wanted to make it a good user experience uh so i was very uh diligent about the tax code stuff and genteel about my my uh communication which is very important in business i think to be that guy and not to be the egoist kind of guy uh, if you can help it however i am a little bit of an egoist uh i think that you know that's coming off a little bit um, I mean, it was a lot of fun because uh, it's like, who scams the scammer? Like, <laughs> I did, you know? Um, and so instead of the first ICO being uh, a mess and being kind of like, I guess, not even a mess, like an abortion, you know what I mean? There's an intentionality in its failure. Um, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think the story's better 
that you know the development continued and they're still now they're funded by uh, tether and they're, they're doing some incremental things they're doing a, a lightning node uh, implementation that's kind of interesting um so i'll give them that uh but yeah like i had later like I, i've also had a lot of problems in uh coming to loggerheads uh with with other sort of controlling sort of people I, like i'm not that controlling that's the problem so i'm like oh i don't want to i'm not gonna like lock horns you know what i mean i'll i'll like play the chess game whatever but but i don't even like that you know it, it's hard to find people that you can uh, trust uh to be like executives together for example um so like I'm, I'm working in a educational game company right now where my read is that everybody's an adult and everybody's uh, kind of relatively pure hearted and professional and it's really nice it's a huge step away from uh from some of the programmer especially like if, if you don't have any programming skills you don't have money then you're you're like you try to meet people you're like hey bro be my cto i'll give you i'll give you 40 percent yeah um and then those relationships are really problematic just because of uh if you're not paying them cash then expectations can you know get skewed over time as as like things drag on and so on you know and then um if you are paying cash you also have to be careful and like you can you can definitely get taken for a ride paying contractors or trying to hire someone more closely if you don't at least have the computer science skills to audit their code output um and things like github you know they give you commit analytics and stuff you it's easy to track you know um so things have gotten a lot better for game development, for programming, for team management, for web hosting, like everything. And then, you know, now we have native money and infrastructure with Bitcoin and so on. So everything's getting better, even though I'm getting older and you're getting older and we're all, you know, like we, we might individually like peak and go over the hill at some point. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I passed that point already. You think so? No, oh, no, no. I'm just kidding. You I, haven't peaked yet. No, Come I'm. On. I'm just hitting my stride. I will be striving in ten plus years. Um, to be honest, I would be okay if I peaked in five years after this. Like, gives me a burst, and then I can like just go crazy, and then be like burnt out at thirty nine. Yeah. And be like, all right, I'm just gonna. Oh, you're old. On. You're old by yeah. that point. Thirty nine, forty. That's old to me. But yeah, I'd like to peak at thirty nine in a furious way yeah and then focus on the family that's, there we go right on okay. there was an old company called focus on the family that made films for for christian families <laughs> and, I, and i watched a number of them has anyone ever told you you are all over the place man <laughs> well, thanks man yeah, yeah no i i very very um very interesting background i think you've had more experience life experience and experience in different roles than most of my guests who are much younger um but you did talk about this educational game company that you're currently working at uh, oh yeah what else are you up to right now what are you working on currently well um you know, I got into writing sci-fi last year. I came up with a pretty cool IP called Blighted Galaxy. That's like 100K plus years in the future. And it's a lot of astrophysics, like literal Star Wars, you know? Um, so I'm trying to like reinvent like action sci-fi and, and make that fresh. So like, I, I got to send those off uh, to a magazine and kind of get get my foot in the door as it were. You know? from uh, train spotting spud um <laughs> anyway and uh yeah then i want to like that could be a video game uh I was, I was kicking around prototyping that but um now that i'm working in games uh, professionally uh and and it's like a, they're like sci-fi oriented math games and that's cool um and we're trying to like revolutionize the cost of education and, and bring that lower so i mean probably i'll put my like game design energies in, into the job because uh, there's only so many fucking you can do you know uh and then i like i got a novel i got a pair of novels actually that adds up to like a thousand words that i uh, want to you know like phil dick style just have like a bottle of speed and just like write it all in a month <laughs> but um 
but I like, I'm just struggling also to schedule that, you know? Right. And, um, and then I look how back you... and it's, it's like, a, I should have done it in 2018 or 19 or something. Yeah. How, how are you finding time for all of this stuff? I can barely handle one podcast. You've got like 16 different things that you're trying to do. How do you do this? Well, one part of adulthood, uh, like adulthood, you know, there's like adulthood, there's like teen, late teen adulthood, which is sort of honorary adulthood. And then there's like 21, 22, you get out and it's like quote unquote adulthood. And then there's like uh, 25 to like 30 is like, like adulthood, but like lowercase. <laughs> and and then you get like 30 to 35 is like adulthood uppercase. And then you get like adulthood asterisks and, and like babies and stuff, you know, or whatever. It depends how you profile your life. But um, yeah, so uh, when you when you get up in the adulthood echelons, um, time management, you realize you're going to die. So time management becomes really important. Um, whereas if, if you're not going to die, it's like, hey, whatever is my flow, you know? And, and I love riding a flow also. Um, but yeah, you, you got to book time. So like what I'm trying to do is book Sundays for uh, writing, you know, edits or like do a flash fiction story or maybe like, you know, start bird bird nesting in some like 500 to 4,000 word, uh, word chapters and, and piece the thing together, uh, bigger thing, right? Or um, so I could, I could start doing that and in an assembly line fashion, eventually incrementally get a novel draft out of it right and that it seems like that's the only way that people ever complete novel drafts because because most people who write novels are adults and most adults have to spend their early time uh you know you gotta spend a little time with your spouse or your spouse is gonna feel super fucking sad and it's it's gonna come back uh so you gotta put that time in you gotta put time in with your kids or you're gonna be like this neglectful artist father right you don't want to do that um and so it's like all this thing you got your car breaks or you gotta go to work you know so um for real, like the only way people write novels pretty much is they find like a month and they uh, crank it out in like August, you know, when the grandparents are around with the kids or whatever, or they book evening sessions and they, they incrementally crunch it out. But I have a higher word output than most authors. Uh, I can hit 1500 good words an hour. Um, it's a sort of fugue state that I get into. So um, maybe, you know, there's better numbers <laughs> if, if I, so, so I just need the discipline. Right. And, and then with the same thing with trading algos, I'm trying to do Saturdays for trading algos until I uh, get out of debt or make a, a serious dent in it. Um, and the thing about trading algos is they're like 80 to 200 hour software projects. And then they're like 10 to 20 hours a month of data revision and, and maintenance. Uh, unless you're doing ARB, in which case operational risk is a lot more of a full-time job. Um, so for instance, if, if multiple exchanges are having in index issues or, or latency issues, overloads, whatever, you can build a certain degree of fail-safes and uh, reactions and dead man switches into your system, of course, but uh, yeah, you know, you're going to be maybe like more stressed, whereas somebody who... Um, runs like scalper algos um with some kind of risk decent risk uh, control like like buying put options or having an equity stop loss where the thing will time itself out or or i don't know by lowering the size if it, if it has a losing streak uh but even that can be counterproductive when you when it when it comes to the expectancy of algos right um so yeah i mean th those things are somewhat lower overheads uh and i do believe I, I think what's fascinating about the bitcoin derivatives markets now finally bringing us to the present um is how young it is you know and um it's a way for people to get into quantitative quote you could say quote unquote quantitative finance you know like with a pepe meme on top but but okay like you can make money like that you don't have to be the best quant in the world to make money in these markets uh, and now it looks like we might have an uptrend this year. It's looking kind of bubbly. So like you can say, oh, I should have had a, a big uh, sort of rom a Romano style position, you know, so I can like double down on it and I can be this, you know, I started with three grand and now I have a 400,000 <laughs> position open, you know, and you can do that too. Um, that's something that 
is probably best done with an algo because I personally haven't been able to do it manually in my trading career. Like I missed out on the gold trend. Um, I underutilized the 2013. I, um, I did 2017 pretty good, that funded trade layer. And then, you know, of course shredded through all the money. Uh, but over, you know, over two years and running a lot of payrolls. Um, so this time I want to do it even better. Like, let's say I don't even like get a dollar out of trade layer and it's like, oh, shucks, I got to come back from, uh, from a fraction of a Bitcoin, you know, and being in debt and, and then, you know, having a job. So that's, you have time, you know, um, then, okay. Like I'm going to compound some alpha and, and ride this trend. So when you're in a, an uptrend, there are strategies that normally might have a, a middling expectancy. Um, those are markets where you'd prefer to be selling options or uh, scalping and maybe holding options to limit risk on those. Uh, but, but having algos that are pivoting and closing uh, rather than building up, uh, building up a trend. Right. But uh, when you're in, uh, when you're in an uptrend, there's rising moving averages. Um, so there's a number of setups based on that uh, that you can configure. And, uh, you know, that shit works and it's simple, you know, it's just like buy the dip, but like a human, a human being can't buy the dip because a human being is a miserable little pile of secrets <laughs> as Vlad Dracula said, you know, um, and, uh, by the way, are you, are you a fan of that game? Which game? Castlevania symphony of the night. Never played it. Oh, Okay. Never, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's that's a famous uh, localization. Yeah, um, it, like right over my head. I just laughed along and let you continue talking because I appreciate I had, that. Though. That's I I'm, need that. Yeah, but, <laughs> I mean, like for the for the most part, I've been following along, but some of your references have just been so far over my head. I don't want to be like, oh, what is that? So I just I just have let it slide. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm glad you called me out at least once. Cause I, I deserve it for not butting in and cutting you off for not knowing it, knowing something specific. Um, it's cool. I'm a, I'm a huge game nerd. So, uh, I see, love to reference the classics. See, I am not, I, I didn't play many video games growing up. I couldn't tell you the last time I played a video game. It was probably some first person shooter about a year ago. Um, okay. So I'm not on, a, on an Xbox. Oh yeah, it was definitely on the on the 360. I'm pretty sure it was when they remastered COD 4, uh, and my buddy was okay. so hard dick about it, and I was like, alright, I'll jump on there. Um, but that's pretty much it. You know, I, I was never huge on gaming, uh, so some of this stuff, you know, it's a little bit over my head when you speak about it. Okay, that's cool. You can call me out if if you if I'm over. Uh, if I'm making overly obscure references, okay. no, that's okay because uh, no I know worries. I know somebody listening to this is going to hear the reference and they're going to fucking love it and they're going to lose their shit. It's a solid reference. Um, yeah, so I mean, so trading to so, so tie it in. Yes, there trading we go. Trading is the greatest game of all. You know, it really trading is. is an MMO, and in the 20th century economic model where there's a growing amount of petroleum-based energy and there was a growing population. Um, the Keynesian central bank paradigm that emerged made sense because it's basically managing a trend line and the central bank is there to basically say, okay, as long as we have social credibility, which is like the asterisk underwriting the whole thing, uh, we have this checkbook that's like an infinite checkbook and we can come in and be the buyer of last resort or, or the lender of last resort as, as the case may be when uh, the trend line uh, at the bottom is, is in trouble, right? So we keep civilization in this channel and it worked because of the fundamentals, right? So now we're in this kind of post-industrial, uh, pre-AI uh, kind of weird um, puberty moment you know, for humanity. And uh, also the, the biome, which is worth several quadrillion dollars if you just do like a cash flow sort of analysis on it uh is at risk of depreciation i'm not going to belabor that point but like there's a lot of chaotic factors and and the uh the growth of the population is no longer given that's an easy one right um 
you know, uh, J Japan, Japanification of everything, like incels are just sort of like the young people manifestation of, of this like retirement uh, overhang. Um, you know, like Japanese people uh, don't, like they have sex later and, and it's like, you know, the culture's changing now. Yeah. They're getting more sex positive, uh, which is which is good for people's happiness, I think. But uh, yeah, you know, so it, it's uh, like, like you ever read uh, Zero HP Lovecraft? Uh, this, uh, uh, nope. Okay, he's one of these. I, I'm I, very, I, very uncultured. I just want to. I, I caught on to this guy because Nick Carter liked his post, and and Nick's sort of like my my go-to insight into like the young sort of conservative with the little c like perspective, uh, like the rationalist kind of like he's sort of a rationalist, right? So this guy's like a rationalist who's also kind of a fascist, and he like jokes about that, and he writes uh, surrealist horror. And, um, and it's kind of like incel lit. It's kind of like blockhead, but like, um, but less, less sex, oh, there. but more, but more sex, but more weird, uh, Cronenberg is, is actually really, if you like fucked up stuff, he's really good. Um, and it's, and it's oddly bro. He's about my age. So like, I just like these strange voices out on Twitter that are self-promoting, uh, that intermingle with the Bitcoin discourse and, you know, add some literary shazam to it. Um, so yeah, there's like a Japanification of, of everybody. And like, so tying this back into trading, you didn't think I was going to be able to do it. No, I really, um, I really thought we were getting very off topic here. You thought we were, you thought we were going down the maw of Azathoth and instead I, I'm looping it back to trading. Um, that's, that's creative discourse, bro. <laughs> so Japanification creates the situation where there's like nothing going, but you can fucking gamble. So if you're good at it, you can make money on your computer and have something of a life in this sort of languid uh, post-industrial wasteland. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I think your audience are people who are aspiring, like I'm aspiring in order to remaster my own financial situation that I, uh, that I imperiled through over spending and, and lax uh, managerial control in my, in my startup. <laughs> Um, I mean, just to like give it and like not laying people off sooner and like being, you know, wait, wavering about decisions. Like I thought money was coming in, it didn't come in, you know? And so I, I personally loaned in money and those, those few months made all the difference, right. As far as the leverage that I have. Um, so for instance, I'm leasing my time in order to, to st stabilize my cash flow instead of having like a 25 K pad with which to generate, uh, income you know so i have to rely on on things like portfolio margin uh or scalping which is which is higher leverage because you just have the, the initial margin plus the uh, the premium uh and that's that's all the margin you need right so as long as the expectancy works it's, it's efficient um and uh you know maybe it would be nice i mean like even when i was managing a, a quarter mil um or and some change it was um there were times where there's no good yield opportunities that are safe. You know what I'm saying? Like with swaps and, uh, and futures, right? Do you know about this? I, a little bit, but not enough to have a full blown conversation about it. So like if I put a Bitcoin on Darabit and then I, and it's trading at 8,500 8, and I sell 8,500 contracts, it's $1 notional. Well, actually there's, it's technically it's 10, but okay. Getting in the weeds. So you sell 8,500 worth of contracts. You're what's called one X hedged. You're one X short against your collateral, right? Yes. And because these contracts are inverse quoted, you can't go bust. So it's it's what we call a cash and carry or a synthetic cash position. Uh, and the genius of what I've accomplished with Trade Layer and what I envisioned uh, sitting in an apartment in this like dive apartment in Buenos Aires with some cool art on the walls. Um, and I, I had this realization um, back then, and, and now we've created it. Uh, well, okay, we're, we're working on the Oracle release this month, and then we're going to polish off the native. So what native is supposed to facilitate is a decentralized uh, sort of anti-tether, right? Like a decent, like something like DAI, right? But DAI is a, um, it's an imperfect setup, right? Um, are you familiar with, with uh, MakerDAO? And yes, 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 yes. Um, so it's like a secured loan, right? At an 80% LTV or, or maybe it's a lot lower. Um, so something like that, if you bought a put for that LTV, 
be away from the market. So that means you, you won't be able to lose any money. Uh, you hedge that up, right? And then like in theory, the interest is enough uh, to pay for the put, right? But th like that's rather uh, capital inefficient. There's a lot of problems with DAI that I'm not gonna get into. Uh, you know, there's plenty of, there's, I've, I've gotten into mudslinging on Twitter, you know, you, you can look it up if, if you really are curious. Um, but what I've done is I've created a, a decentralized version of the, the BitMEX model, where if, if you hedge the swap, then you're going to be exposed to the swaps interest rate, uh, which is a stability mechanism. It's a way to encourage arbitrage to keep the swap in line with the market. Um, and because it's perpetual duration, you can, in theory, hold this like uh, like a dollar. But like on BitMEX, it's just stuck on their account. You have custodial risk. Um, you know, they're well capitalized. They have an insurance fund. There's nice things to say about BitMEX. But um, I just had to create a decentralized dollar because um, I think we're going to need it, right? Like, as long as it's up to Arthur Hayes, I'm not like, let's say Arthur Hayes is the coolest dude on this planet today. Uh, like number one and coolest dude. Um, I'm willing to believe that, but he can still get black bagged by, uh, by old Xi Jinping man in, in Hong Kong and taken out of there. <laughs> so he got, he got the fuck out of Hong Kong. <laughs> like yeah. he's not an idiot, right? Yeah. You saw him on the boat, right? So like, I don't know where he, maybe he's still hanging in Hong Kong. Maybe it's no big deal, but it, but it, it makes me uncomfortable. Right. Uh, and it should, right. The fundamental game theory of this stuff is, uh, it's gotta be state, uh, attack resistant. Right. Um, so we, we built this decentralized, uh, op return based protocol. That's a fork of Omni layer. And then we added a decentralized clearing algorithm which solves a graph theory problem and you can have so like if, if you're doing central clearing like uh for for example these ethereum based derivatives dexes um you, you're familiar with uh your finance guys you're familiar with like clearing houses and futures and stuff like that yes 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 definitely yeah so not enough to have a conversation with you because you're too fucking big brain to even try like stop it. I swear to fucking god man like yes I have stop. a I have a general understanding of it but like you are so far out of my league at this point I think that I just want to let I'm... you talk because I feel like you can get information out to my audience and like me I'll just get in the way you know like I I'm trying to figure out you know how I can contribute to this conversation but I think, yeah. you know, with I'm every... I'm thinking about that meme with the guy with the big brain and he's like salivating. That's you. He's got That's... like glasses. Yeah, I yeah. got the glasses for sure. That's you right there, um, yeah. I mean, like you're... Those you're... are my glasses. I'm like, I see that meme. I'm like, those are my glasses. <laughs> what is this? Like you're, 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 you're definitely the expert here. I'm like very far out of my element. So like, you know, if you just want to go off, I, I totally understand. I'm going to try to... Well, Ooh. you know, like what, what makes my intelligence kind of unusual and I, I think value adding to the things I do is um, I'm really good at interpersonal connections and systemic visualization. And then I'm also good at language. And so I, I come up with these trippy, but also there's an odd logic that you can pull out of it. Like, you know, with the sci-fi, with the games, like it's kind of what I do, you know? Um, so I'm not the smartest guy in the world when it comes to actually like crunching uh, the numbers on some of these things. Uh, although I, I'm okay at that. Um, yeah. Okay. So like clearing is all about credit relationships, blah, blah, blah. Right? So you go back, um, to like the bankers, of Lombard street in London in the, in the 1870s. And, um, this guy will tell you, you can look this book up. It's fabulous. If you really are a student of, uh, market history, you should definitely look up bankers of Lombard street. Uh, it's free online. And he talks about how bank of England has gone bust multiple times. And every time got bailed out by cash infusion for selling equity in it. And it kind of was like the insurance fund of, of the markets of its time. Right. Uh, and then like most of the commercial credit downstream would also be secured loans, but sometimes uh, shipments sink and, and so on. Right. And so usually that was within the bounds of what the interest rates covered, but every so often there would be this kind of crisis, you know? So, Financial crises, even in a country that like, like Ray Dalio has uh, written a lot about debt crises that happens at a, a national level, but um, even rich countries with like the most thriving uh, 
financial markets of the world at that time still have this periodic uh, systemic uh, risk situation. And um, I'm like kind of a student of 2008 financial crisis. So I was really freaking out about the uh, scaremonger media talking about like a quadrillion dollars in derivatives. And I was like, what? That's so much money. Who's going to come up with all that? And then I like learned more about it. I'm like, wow, there's a netting. So somebody could buy credit default swaps to hedge their um, their bonds or they could buy excess credit default swaps or they could sell excess credit default swaps, just like a leveraged option, right? Um, if like, if you go on dare a bit, you can uh, sell an option, like one Bitcoin option uh, for with a 0.1 BTC collateral that you put up. Um, so that's a 10 X no, notional leverage, right? You might, you might take in 0.1 BTC if it's long enough uh, dated. So, um, or, or you could take in just a few bit cents selling a weekly, right? So credit def like AIG selling credit default swaps well in excess of their, uh, the positions, you know, that, that was sort of like that. And it seemed like free money until it was, it was a huge uh, burner, but, but CDS was small. It's mostly, um, it's mostly FX swaps and uh, interest rate swaps. So interest rate swaps are what sovereigns and other major borrowers, you might say they're the wholesale borrowers in the world. They're the ones who people trust the most for statist political reasons that are sort of uh, baked in the 20th century, right? But okay, so now we're moving on, but, but people still trust them. Uh, and then, you know, so they borrow and borrow and they account for a lot of the money supply that goes into that, that borrowing then goes into local economies, you get the commercial money multiplier and so on. Um, so there's M1, M2, and M3. M1 comes from monetary pot, well, there's M0s, like the, the coins and the, the physical paper, but um, M1 is sort of like the, t the immediate uh, banking system. And, uh, and I guess you would include the physical in that. M2 is, is all of the money that uh, people like me take out loans and that money gets lent into existence. I go pay for uh, an airline ticket with a credit card. In a sense, the, the USD, the land in their checking account is, um, is all good, you know, it's, it's all new. And uh, of course it's all fungible as well. So it doesn't, who cares whether it came from someone's credit card or, or someone's debit card, right? Um, but until you have a systemic crisis, right? So like everything that has had a centralized topography in its network design as a financial system, whether it was the Bank of England or it was the New York Fed, um, they've all had this periodic turbulence. And what reserve backed money that's based on crypto and a derivative, that's P2P, what that does is it decentralizes it. And you get a topography where there are these little islands of counterparties that are connected in these in these webbings and um, you don't have a central counterparty so the problem that i was chewing on since like 2015 and then i kind of hit on a graph I, I like learned more about graph theory and i hit on an initial idea of what an algo might look like and then i recruited a math that was 2017 i recruited a math phd uh a year and a half of r d on that uh, including figuring out how to make it work for uh, perpetual rolling settlements, not just a one-time uh, expiration. Um, so that's like a thousand lines of code in our in our source code file in the repo. Um, it's, you know, pretty a pretty big portion of what we did in the project that was fresh. Um, and the reason why it's important, so the technical reason, because I think some people might dig this, um, and because if you just look at the code, it's, it's going to seem very weird. Um, basically if somebody goes bust and there's no counterparty to their order, so the system is at a shortfall, right? Uh, you would have to have what's, what's called socialization of losses, right? Uh, as the default thing, or you have, uh, some insurance fund with some balance and people are made whole out of that. And over time, the insurance fund on average tends to collect more, more fees and, uh, liquidation penalties then it pays out in these events, right? But let's say it happens. And um, even I think technically, even before you apply the insurance fund to make people whole or you apply a socialization, it's a hard problem. It's not MP hard, but it's it's hard enough to 
it was a new algo. We, we did a lot of research on other uh, work in the field in graph rewrite algos, and we didn't find anything that would rewrite a graph to net zero based on a, an arbitrary target price, like your, your settlement price, right? Um, and in the process, like, let's say, like, generally speaking, things will net, like, most of the time. Um, so for instance, if you're running, uh, the DX DY contract on Ethereum, they're probably having either a data structure or God forbid, a singular global variable, like a cache. Um, so I haven't, I haven't audited their code. So I'm just kind of shooting, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on DX DY, but I'm pretty sure there are derivative architectures on Ethereum where it's a central contract and the contract has some central thing that it goes, okay. Now it's at a debit, now it's at a positive. Um, and things net out in this somewhat global way. Um, so what we did here is we made everything bilateral and everything flows in a contiguous chain. Uh, and there's an atomicness to the contracts. And then if there is, God forbid, but okay, you know, crypto is volatile. If there is uh, a big red order like we used to see on on bitmax and those always got filled right because they would come in uh, people get margin called for back in 2016 it was like two million bucks let's say or 10 10 was a lot back then now it's not that much in in, in derivative notional i mean spot 10 is kind of a lot still um and so like for instance the dip from uh it, it got up to like 475 480 and then it took a little dip and it, and it went through 460 really fast and, and it went to to 450 lit candle. And there was a big, big red order up. I think it was only 400K actually. So I nibbled on it. I took like 100K. And uh, and I made like a quick thousand bucks and some change back in May uh, 2016 sometime. So, you know, that's, just, that's actually a profitable trading strategy as well. Um, but that's because Bitcoin, so like if I just did it with, with a new coin, it's, it's more tenuous. Like Bitcoin had all these years of, of market momentum behind it. And it was, it was in a bull, right? Uh, so of course, as long as you're in a bull market, it's, it's going to be cool, right? So what if it's not a bull market and the thing actually like gap down like 5% and then, you know, went down more and recovered a little bit, but it never actually closes that gap, right? So there's going to be orders hanging on that, um, that the insurance fund has to make up the difference on. Um, and then in order to make it a deterministic algorithm, for decentralized clearing that you just run this code and you can just read an arbitrary set of trades, including ones that have these discontinuations and, and resolve it to a set of settled pairs, the counterparty. So now I'm, now I'm in a contract with you. Like you, you, you traded with, uh, with Slobo and then Slobo got wiped out. Right. And then, um, and then I, I was trading with these other guys and I've got a nice position open. And then at the end of the day, um, even with that hole in it, the algo can uh, sort subgraphs and, and factor everything out and, and find, a, find a balance. And, um, and if the, of course, if the balance has to come from the insurance fund, then, then it comes from the insurance fund. But um, that's what we built. So it's a utility for decentralized contract clearing. Um, the Oracle version that we're putting out is going to support the Bitcoin uh, liquid index. I'm trying to work with uh, Brave New Coin on that. We've been talking about this uh, for years. Um, BLX, pretty good uh, index. I worked on it myself a little bit back in 2016. Um, and then the fees are going to be super low because it's a DAX. And uh, you're going to be able to trade with someone for one basis point. Um, and then DEXs are bad because of the online, uh, excuse me, on-chain order book. Uh, are you, you're super familiar with uh, a little bit how Bitcoin works with timestamps? Of course. Charles? Yes, yes, yes. So you get one timestamp for the block. And, uh, and then the individual transactions get a timestamp. But it's a very fuzzy one. Uh, and also miners, if they had an incentive, could reorder the transactions if, if there was enough money in it. So um, it's it's just like for an algo trader, it's like, pff, like I'm, I'm not going to do that. Like that's right. So I actually wrote an algo 
to use the Omni DAX in early 2017 to arbitrage it on Poloniex with uh, MadeSafe. And uh, I realized I was going to be spending so much in fees just quoting that it, it was it was like a non-starter. And then in 2018, I put in a lot of time and money and uh, had a whole other dev on it to do work on uh, Tendermint. And uh, Tendermint's sort of a bonded stake federated protocol. Uh, and you can run sort of side chains with it. So the idea is the side chains would be the order books. Uh, and then we would settle things on Bitcoin. But uh, it was a very top heavy approach. So in my, um, in my detriment and, and in my plight, back in uh, May, uh, early on a, a Sunday morning, I came up with the other big innovation that went into the trade layer design, which is trade channels. And I realized that the cryptographic finality that I was looking for in Tendermint actually exists in two of two multi-sigs. So if I um, make a transaction and I sign it and then I hand it to you and it, it's not gonna be good in, uh, in three more blocks. So I'm kind of giving you an option. You could kind of screw me and like hold on to this check, right? Um, and we both committed, um, let's say some USDC into this channel. So we've got like a hundred bucks each in there and the trade is for um, like a thousand dollars worth of a Bitcoin exposure. So, um, you know, if we have a good trading relationship and there's a good data there, I, I should expect from you that you're, you're just going to automatically uh, check it, co-sign it and, and then we'll hold it and we can update it. So we don't have to pay the fee, either the minor fee or, or the uh, protocol fee. And we can kind of kick the can uh, and save money on um, fees that way. And then I could like close the trade out with you and we, and we could, uh, you know, try, try to save on uh, costs that way. So it's flexible uh, to the way that trading relationships tend to work at very large scales in institutions uh, where people contact each other over chat rooms. And uh, lately, uh, requests for quote based markets have become predominant. So there's more automation to that process. It's not like hitting someone up on Blackberry, uh, like 10 years ago or, or 12 or 13 years ago and, and buying a uh, hundred million worth of muni bonds over, you know, because it's a relationship, right? So, you know, the person, that's how everything used to get done. Now everything's becoming systematized and, um, the Bitcoin derivative markets are very ripe for fee disruption this is something that's already happening but there hasn't been a really good uh decentralized thing that's that's offering like a wholesale fee rate yet so naturally uh, a bitcoin dax for derivatives is is a good place to kick that off um and then over time once there's some fee revenue in some of these more centralized things like a dollar coin and Oracle contracts that are, are lower cost um, that supports uh, the meta coin. So we did a coin kind of like Omni, but with a cooler emission scheme. And uh, instead of giving ourselves a pre mime, uh, but also instead of bankrupting ourselves, right. Uh, which, which, you know, is what we, would happen if we didn't do a founder reward, we have uh, vesting tokens and they vest based on the volume. So we have to actually get it, uh, generating i think it's like hundreds of thousands of bitcoin in volume before we see uh, a substantial part of that in liquidity um so it's performance links it's not just time links um and maybe maybe i'm screwing myself there but uh you know potentially. i figured it was the right move no yeah I, I potentially think, i think uh you're potentially screwing yourselves but uh being a little bit more honest and fair about it uh, which I think people will appreciate, but man, I, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm just going to say it again. I am, you know, I have brain damage and you're much bigger brain than me. And a lot of this was going over my head. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, okay. Yeah. I kind of went through a lot. Um, no, it's okay. You know, I, uh, it's fine that it's over my head. Like I'm not too worried about it. I'm more concerned with my general audience who I think is a little bit more simple. 
you may have been speaking to a very small portion of my audience there, which hmm. fine by me. Um, but I think, you know, just based on the guests that I've had on and the people who I talk to in my DMs, um, may have been a little bit over their head as well. Is there sure any way yeah, to can we break it down a little bit? Yes. Is there any way to kind of dumb it down as much as possible? Okay. So like the whole thing about network topology and the history of finance and the clearing algo was like a deep dive on, you know, what went into that. But basically uh, we don't, we want to have a decentralized thing where you can look at uh, transactions on Bitcoin that are confirmed and then say from this set of trades, we infer bing, this set of settlements, right? And then people get paid, right? So you'll, if, if you're long uh, a swap, the market goes down, you'll have an unrealized loss. And the reason that uh, derivatives exchanges do settlements is so let's say it's a future and it, it's got a few weeks, right? Um, it would be a real drag if you were stuck, or let's say you had a profit on it. It'd be a drag if you couldn't get your profit liquid until expiration, right? So uh, OKX in the early days, they had a weekly settlement uh, with the weekly futures. And then uh, BitMEX introduced this and then uh, Deribit as well. I think BitMEX is every eight hours. I think Deribit it's every 24 hours, might be every 12. Um, so basically unrealized uh, balances become realized at settlement, right? So things have to move around. So people have to get paid, right? So how do you figure out who gets paid? Um, most of the time it's kind of simple, but um, but if there's a disaster, then there's more more graph manipulation involved. And that's what we basically came up with. Um, and then the other part is that DEXs suck uh, because they're slow and expensive and, and you can get uh, you know, sniped by miners if there's enough money at stake and you don't get the satisfaction or for algo traders, it's an essential thing of uh, being able to know that you got an execution in a very short latency, right? Latency is everything in trading. Um, you don't need, you know, I don't think you need like super low latency, like Pico seconds, you know, like, uh, like New Jersey data centers. Um, I think because Bitcoin's a global market, the lower bound on arbitrage is gonna there's gonna be like a fuzzy zone of of maybe maybe uh, I don't know maybe like hundreds of microseconds or or maybe we're even talking about a uh, single digit millisecond amount of time um, to you know to percolate price information around the globe, right? Um, don't quote me on the exact math, here, but it, but it's a reasonable number. Um, and then people can kind of specialize on, on different venues and, and doing cross arb is at some point it's going to become a guessing game uh, as far as order book exchanges go, because there's going to be more quants in the market. So they're going to be like, pew, 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 right. And then uh, it, it, it comes down to this relativistic uncertainty. And then there's going to be someone with a satellite. So that's going to be like the uh, radio towers from New from Chicago to New York, but for Bitcoin trading, right? Because you're going to be able to ping, like maybe Blockstream will, will start leasing their satellite and finally make some real money. Um, yeah, you like that? <laughs> Just talking a little little shade there. No, Blockstream's cool, man. They, they do good research on uh, stuff like uh, MAST, uh, and there's some interesting op codes that are being proposed. And I'm optimistic about uh, what I'm excited about in the coming 12 months. Glad you asked. I did uh, not yet, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, you want to ask? <laughs> no, no. So here, here's the thing. I think that this topic at hand is very, very specialized. There is a small portion of my audience that will be stupid interested in it. Rock hard Oh, listening. you mean the, the mass stuff? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So, so. Here's my thing is that I, when I have people on, I try to make it a little bit more general so that my entire sure. audience can kind of get some information out of each one of them. So that last okay. kind of bit on trade layer was very, very specific. I think some people are going to fucking love it, but I do want to try to open it up a little bit. So like, you know, you're working in a startup, you know, trade layer, layer yeah. is a crypto startup in kind of like every sense of the word. 
So like, yeah, you know, we, we talked about this beforehand. You had some questions. I gave you some questions uh, and I kind of want to bring it to this question of, you know, can we get to some just do's and don'ts of startups in general? Uh, because yeah. you're going through all of these kind of issues. You've dealt with a lot of shit. You know what to do. You yep. know what not to do. And so I want my almost everyday Joe Schmo listener to be able to take something away from this episode. Um, so can you hit us with some do's and don'ts? Absolutely. Yeah. And there'll, there'll be like little crunchy talking points, right? So that's Yeah, cool. exa- um, exactly. Okay. So number one, don't buy in to the cargo call of entrepreneurship. Okay. Like startup Chile was like kind of like this because it was in Chile and there, there isn't really a startup culture here. They just thought they would like graft it on. Right. Um, and then, you know, you got to keep it real. You got to think about your cash flow, your assets, and not actually be as idealistic as I was in my startup career. I've done like seven startups, and then now I'm employed in like another one, right? So I've been employed in, in more startups than that, even. Uh, but they were startups of varying degrees, right? Some of them had VC money and blah, blah, blah. Like they got valued at nine figures or something like that. But, um, yeah, so it's kind of a fake economy built on the fake uh, money uh, you know, <laughs> stimulus and so on, you know, because it's like, oh, the VC's got to put the money here and then we got to hire these guys. So it creates these cool jobs for millennials like me. Uh, be, be a game designer, be a product manager, be a, a crypto guy, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and, and like, you know, it's funny getting out of the building, getting out of this crypto shit is a little bit, you know, and, and thinking about, providing value to parents who are trying to help their children learn mathematics. That's like a very concrete thing yeah. that literally hundreds of millions of people are interested in paying for. If you can like grease the wheel there uh, in any kind of interesting statistical data representation, right? Which is, you know, um, that's part of what I'm working on. And um, it's like a real unmet need, right? So this is entrepreneurship 101 and if if your thing is like well we're gonna make a coin and it's gonna like have really cool properties <laughs> we're gonna trade it because of the properties you know that might be true but then of course with the financial thing it takes longer so you, you can't do lean startup uh so what you really want to do is, is you want to be like real about your own cash flow and you and about what you could do with something relatively simple like an algo that would buy you a 50% long futures position when it dings the 55 hour moving average or something like this, you know, and just do like, that's easier to accomplish than, than doing a software startup. Right. Um, so think really rationally about getting into a better financial position and compare um, the opportunity cost of doing any startup idea to these more, you know, you can also hold Bitcoin, there are these interest rates, like, you know, like the, the amount of risk that I've fucking taken instead of putting money into, into Bitcoin, for example, <laughs> uh, I, I could have like, I could have done things in a somewhat different order. Uh, or like, you know, I did make out pretty well on 17. I, I could have uh, downsized everything. So I, so I fucked up on budgeting. Don't fuck up on budgeting. Um, don't uh, hire your family members, probably. Um, yeah, definitely not. That are, fuck that. Yeah, uh, probably <laughs> don't raise money from your family members if, if you can help it. Um, but if you must, uh, maybe uh, put in some more preferred puts or whatever, you know, or make it like a loan or a convertible or something, you know. Um, so it's nice, you know, like if there's an interest only convertible aspect and you're actually servicing it, like, uh, it's, it, cause usually on convertibles, the interest converts into more shares cause they don't care about the, the interest, right? That's just, a, it was a, a fast way to do deals in, in the Bay area in like 2011. Uh, um, oh, so that brings me to another point. Uh, like don't overcomplicate the financing. Um, definitely read all the documents. Um, you should probably have an armchair familiarity with, with the law, at least in the country you live in, uh, particularly in the industry you want to apply to. That's, that's important. Um, try to be your own lawyer. And then in addition to that, uh, find a great lawyer and give them equity. Uh, it's, it's pretty good advice. Um, Beautiful advice, see. actually. Uh, audit your programmer's code. 
uh, don't take forever to fire people. I hate it when com- I mean to hire people. I hate it when companies do this. Like you have like two, like you know, like three interviews and then a technical interview and then it's like a stupidly the worst founded technical interview that has like a hard twenty minute time limit. You know, maybe, maybe that's too much. You can you can hire people after like one like a an, an overnight technical challenge, a sort of the tech interview and and a, and a couple of phone calls. Yeah, or an or, or a phone call and an in person. You, you can hire someone like that, but audit their code and fire them in like one or two months if if they're not meeting you know the target that you need to justify the, the payroll. Um, just a little rigor goes a long way in uh, in managing humans, and especially in a technical enterprise. Um, and then uh, yeah, try to get customers sooner. Try to identify uh, if people are really willing to pay or if they just like it. Uh, have enough respect for your time to ask. And um, there was a bit about sales from Adam Townsend, who I follow, uh, who everyone here should follow. He's a really bright guy. Um, and he was saying, as far as sales go, like your salespeople will give you the best feedback. And uh, don't be afraid to raise your price 200% and have the premium product instead of being the low cost. I, I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, in, in my case with Trade Layer, I am taking a pricing power oriented approach as far as like, how am I disrupting the economics in this industry? And it's like, of course, like taking the fees to the mat, you know, like it stacks, like uh, KYC gets modulated out. You can parameterize your actions with KYC chips so that if you're an issuer, you can limit who trades it, for example, all all kinds of good liability limiting stuff, but like who actually is accountable for those chips is going to be different companies, right? And then just Bitcoin and Litecoin are, are just blockchains, right? And and this layer is just transactions that are out on those blockchains, you know, and it is what it is. Uh, but you can be compliant. It's not trying to fiddle its nose at the law. Um, so don't do that <laughs> um, would be another piece of advice. Uh, don't be like one of these guys who gets, you know, hit by FinCEN or, um, or the SEC. Like those guys are jokers. Um, I mean, I imagine somebody listening to this is thinking about entrepreneurial things in the context of crypto finance, right? Uh, Or applying crypto finance to supercharge uh, the growth of a balance sheet in a more traditional uh, business, you know? Um, I think think you're overestimating my audience by a long (laughs) shot. Dude, I've had people who come on here who are selling goddamn t-shirts. Like, yeah, it's a very mixed bag with who I've had on this podcast. And I think... This is for like the intro, I want to get my feet wet. I want to start a little small business or side hustle. Obviously, I've yeah. had some bigger names on who have been doing some huge things. Um, you yourself are one of those people. Uh, but I think for the most part, it's very unsophisticated stuff. You know, I was giving you a hard time for when you were talking about Trade Layer itself and all of the kind of background shit i was like you're going too far and then i'm like all right let's get into the business do's and don'ts that i can talk about that my audience can vibe with you start talking about financing i'm like no 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 no. none of my audience is looking for having a good finance strategy is the most important thing in startups because what differentiated like for example ray Kroc from the mcdonald's brothers right who got a million dollars after cash like they're playing into round number bias they like hate the government, so it has to be after taxes, the million, you know. Um, and they were settling, right? And Ray Kroc teamed up uh, with this guy who in the movie is played by uh, B.G. Novak. He's like, man, why are, you, why are you struggling for this little bit of cash flow? You should be getting the land, borrowing against the land, amortizing it with the good lease rent from the franchisee, who you also already collected uh, a royalty from. Uh, and then, And then you your spreadsheet grows like this, you know? And then of course the story is uh, an immortal story of the 20th century. And you know, the stock's been doing pretty well this century so far. So why not 21st century as well, right? Um, and Starbucks does it like, so every like retail thing got into this, right? Cause the, the, the best finance strategy will outcompete and like eat the lesser businesses who are just like, we're working off a of cash flow, you know? Yeah. And there's definitely something for having that mindset. Cause you look at like Bay area startup uh, guys and, and they raise such stupid amounts of equity money. Um, and they waste it a lot of the time, but, um, 
but just because they've had excesses, uh, you know, doesn't mean that uh, borrowing can't be useful, uh, especially if it's scalable, if you can amortize something, you know, um, like for instance, uh, e-commerce on the internet, right? Whether you have e-commerce or it could be like a video game or it could be enterprise software, anything where you're trying to get traffic online, there's a funnel and then somebody might pay, right? And you have some conversion rate. Yes. Um, with those kind of things, if you have established strong metrics about your key values, uh, which are the lifetime value of a customer and the cost of acquiring a customer. So it costs you like a buck to get a click and then you get like a viral of like uh, for every two people, someone will invite another person, right? So that's decent. And uh, so that kind of brings it down a, a little bit, uh, the cost. And then uh, let's say your conversion rate isn't great. Let's say it's like, well, just to keep the math simple, let's say it's 10%, right? So um, you have to spend like 10 bucks to get 10 people in, but actually bring you 15 people. So you, you spend six bucks to bring in six people, they bring in nine, you get one sale. And if that sale is greater than the cost of acquiring that customer, that's pretty good, right? And how long does it take to, to earn that out, right? So if you can say, well, the metrics show pretty good, the people dig it and then some pay, and maybe we can tweak this up a little bit. And, uh, and, and we're going to buy ads for it, you know, then you should be using that to buy the ads because in six to eight weeks, you're going to be able to pay it off just by the revenue. Right. Um, and some companies do that by raising equity and then they spend a ton on ads. Right. So that, that's kind of like consumer internet business in like 20, early 2010s and things like, uh, Uber and WeWork and like Blue Apron and all these fad companies. Right. Uh, they, they like took that to the limit, right? Cause they just reinvest all their money into the, the, the marketing. Um, it was better when, when they actually owned real estate and they would borrow, <laughs> like they should be doing financial engineering, like, like Ray Kroc, man. Like that's, that's really fucked up. Um, so like in Bitcoin, the real estate is the Bitcoin, you know? So if you have a treasury policy, even if you run like a bodega with your dad in like your town or something, it's okay. Like you can get supercharged on, on crypto, man. Um, and I guess like to, to simplify things, like what I, what I'm trying to do with trade layer besides allow people to do OTC derivatives trades at a, at a very low cost, uh, very quickly in a decentralized environment, which is, there we cool. go. We, we finally got it out of you. The bare bones, what trade layer actually is. I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is where I struggled on, on previous podcasts to be is so thanks, but also that's like, you can accomplish that with like circle USD and, and brave new coin running in Oracle, but then you got to trust circle and brave new coin. So we have a native version that we're going to follow up with after this release. And the idea there is if there's enough trading on the chain, you can use that data instead of some trusted Oracle to settle the contract. And, uh, you have to make it expensive to try to manipulate. So there's more rebates for people who put orders up. Um, and the fees are higher for those for trading tokens, right? And then you can use the meta coin that we've uh, that we've created. So you know, I mean, it's like mea culpa. It's like our our shit coin, as as they say. But like you know, it works just as sort of a, us being exposed to the the overall volume. But then if people actually trade it, and we get some kind of uh, manipulation resistance in that uh, activity, so it's it's like kind of solid. Uh, then we can have uh, decentralized dollars that are are backed by this coin that live on Bitcoin or live on Litecoin and that earn some yield. So it's like a decentralized, uh, I don't, I don't want to say banking system, right? Because that maybe attracts the wrong attention, but like a decentralized currency system. Uh, it's based on derivatives. So it might change the world. I think it will. Uh, and what it means for everyday people is that you can have dollars on Bitcoin that pay you a variable rate, but you know, maybe it's, I, I can't, I can't like say it's, it's going to be X, Y, Z, right. But like, maybe it's good. The rates on BitMEX have been pretty cool on some of these other uh, swap exchanges. So that's like an interest rate. That's like a dollar mar money market rate that exists today, but it's centralized. And if we decentralize it, then Bitcoin is so much more useful because now uh, if, for example, everybody in Iran wanted to flip the Iranian government. Uh, they could protest by cashing out of the Iranian banking system, trading into these uh, synthetic dollars 
and they, they could do it with Bitcoin, but then they're exposed to the Bitcoin volatility. It's a harder adoption that way. And it hasn't, you know, it hasn't caught on, right? Nobody uh, puts everything into Bitcoin, but like if you were in a situation like Iran and it kind of made sense to get all your money or like Lebanon, for example, um, it made sense to get your money out of the bank, then boom, hold on to these synthetic dollars. I'm not saying people should hold hundred percent. You know, if you're in like a, especially in a stress situation, hold some, some cash, I don't know, some physical gold, what, whatever's clever. You can have a mix of things. People like living in Japan where things aren't that weird will probably hold a higher ratio of bank deposits just because bank deposits are, are trustworthy to these people, right? So great, it's still experimental, but um, I want there to be decentralized savings in dollars at, at a competitive free market interest rate for everybody. And that's what I've been working so hard on. And that's why I sacrificed uh, all that time and money and, and personal relationship health and, and mental health and everything else to crawl to the finish line on the tray layer, man. Because we, I wanted to live in a, in a timeline in our history as a species. I did an okay job there, kind of like uh, summarizing the man, the manifesto or whatever. No, you did, yeah. It, that was much easier to follow. I know my audience will have a much easier time following that. Um, if only it was at, at the beginning instead of the end. <laughs> no, that is okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not even going to do any editing. I'm just going to throw this one out there. Uh, I think... Man. I think me trying to edit it will just make it sound worse. I think it flows very naturally. You, you know, you just speak, you kind of, okay. you know, yeah. let everything come out. Uh, but Don't let's post. no post. <laughs> no. no yeah. Post There's, I mean, honestly, like the, I've been taking a more hands off approach lately where I, don't edit as much. I kind of just let the conversations flow. Uh, Do you know um, Neutral Milk Hotel? It's a band from the '90s. Yeah. Why? Why the fuck do I know that? Who? Like. Well, uh, the uh, what's her face from Parks and Rec? Yeah. And there we go. Funny that, woman. She would, yeah, Her character was really into them. Yeah. Stupid. And shit. my wife's really into them, and I I was really into them. I wanted to make a romance video game in 2008 with that as the soundtrack. <laughs> Um, just a little sidebar, but, uh, when they, when he recorded, Oh, Comely, which is like kind of the centerpiece emotionally of the album, it's like seven minutes long. He just did the whole thing, uh, unplugged acoustic in the studio in one raw take. And his buddy was like hanging out there kind of like vibing, like, yeah, jab, go, you know? So at the end of the song, it's like so powerful. And this guy goes like, Holy shit. Like in the background, you know? And it, it's like a classic, uh, kind of example of that energy there we go no see I, i'll uh i'll uh take care of a little bit of it i will obviously edit out the two times i have got up but other than that it'll be pretty pretty just go with the flow you know you you have at it but um we do have to wrap up at some yes. point um so just one kind of two last questions i guess but i'm just gonna put it all together and have yeah. you speak um so excited for in the last in the next twelve months, you've kind of talked about some things that you're planning on doing. But if you could give us yeah, anything else, yeah, I want to else. raise some money, get the liquidity as we launch, and uh, I want to get a lot of traders on board and, and create like a sort of confederation of the algo guys, uh, and and also the more sophisticated retail people, especially non-US. Like US is, is like more complicated, unfortunately, as as people know. Of hundred percent. I mean, so, so so what are your plans there? What are your plans for onboarding well, and getting um, people to as use far as it? My uh, prop trading directly, I either have to register with FinCEN or filter out U.S. persons. Um, no, so no, 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 no. To... I'm, I'm I'm talking with regards to just onboarding customers. Like, what's your what's your goal there? Oh yeah, so I've been networking with uh, some some fellas that you and I both know. Uh, and also some other fellas, um, and I've, I've been getting a pretty good read of the guys who are not in shops, who are kind of indie, and who do anywhere from like a few billion a year uh, in Notional to maybe like 16, just for a lot of scalps and, and like algo sort of sniper type trades um, for like, you know, whatever, 58K, 100K each, and, and that's like 200K, and you do, uh, you do a couple of those a month. So that's like the spectrum, right? Um, and because you can make these like quote rooms where people can make channels with each other and start doing a lot of flow, um, I'm trying to help algo traders, uh, get onboarded with that so they can cross their flow. 
So like if somebody's trading on BitMEX and they're just trying to catch rebates, they're just quoting the market and they're trying to stay pretty close to the front of the queue and stuff like that. So they might be they might they might have an algo that has a model that peppers orders around so that the orders are there to be in, in the front of the queue, you know, in the future, right? And and so they're trying to farm rebates. And every time they get a rebate, every time they get a boop, little fill over on, on Max or on Darabit or on Bybit, whatever, a lot of these guys have rebates, right? Um, then you could trade with somebody who's quoting on trade layer and pay a smaller fee than the rebate. So that's cool, right? Uh, and there's there's a little wiggle room in, in how you quote. Um, so then other kinds of trading strategies can get involved and the whole thing can start to snowball and we just start with a, a BitMEX, I'm sorry, uh, a BLX, Bitcoin index contract uh, and Litecoin. Litecoin's like pretty undertraded in derivatives. So the Litecoin version obviously will do a Litecoin uh, Oracle there. Um, we'll bootstrap that. And then like, if I can get some money for DAV, like first and foremost, money that comes in, I need to put to shoring up some uh, market making liquidity. Um, then I have to, you know, pay people. Right. And then if I can actually recruit a few people from like the lightning network, uh, dev community, for example, um, and some people who, you know, they're, they're not like Greg Maxwell, but they have some familiarity with the new op codes. I might be able to engineer a way to wrap Bitcoin natively and turn it into a, a token and that it gets cleared through one of these mass constructs, right? So that way you wouldn't even have to use a MetaCoin or you wouldn't have to use USDC or something like that. You could just use Bitcoin and we would have like the perfect Bitcoin stack. So if, I don't know if I'll get there in 12 months, but that's that's actually where I see Bitcoin going over the next three or four years. Um, it's gonna have this whole native derivative stack and it's just gonna be sick, right? And it's gonna be like, it's gonna be the financial system that we dreamed of. And I'm just trying to move it faster towards that. Um, so yeah, just launching this thing and like uh, paying myself back a little bit and like starting to see if uh, this idea of a decentralized dollar, I mean, obviously people like it on Ethereum, right? Why, I don't see why it shouldn't be super huge and all of my suffering, totally worth it. And I'm excited to see if that's true. <laughs> yeah. You've uh, you've got a massive year ahead of you. I, I think you, it's going to be an uphill battle. I know that, but yeah, I'm I, used to that. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like you're ready for that. You're used to that. And I think you can push through that. Um, I should have been a Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Just like don't invest in anything. Just like I bought Litecoin in February. And yeah. February, and that was my year. You know what I mean? Right. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. No, you're, you're, you're putting in, you know, the effort. You're probably spending a lot of time inside and you know, working harder than oh, yeah. you, you probably. Oh, and I live in a beautiful paradise. I know. Too, so it's, yeah, yeah. I'm like super indoors though. Yeah. Like all of the money that you have invested into this, you could have just bought some Bitcoin. Um, could have bought a house, <laughs> had a baby. You know, I'm yeah. just like a human being who doesn't exist. Yeah. I chose to pursue this venture. You like know. an abortion, <laughs> but, but a little bit different. Oh, just a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, causally it's the same, right? So. I'm I'm proud. No, I I. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trolling. This to to um, reel it back in, I yeah. think. Uh, no, I think I think your hard work and everything that you've kind of given up will pay off if you keep at it. It sounds like you have a very clear vision of what you want to do and what you're going to do. Um, it kind of hinges on a couple things, but I think those will all kind of fall into place. Uh, to wrap it up, I guess, can you, yeah. cause you know, I, I, I always try to wrap it up with a biggest tip, you know, so can you give okay. your mm. biggest tip to one, just like the, here, let's dumb it down even more. The yeah. mon you, you can, you can put a stop loss over a fractal on a chart and you can double down on your futures position and then you can have a lot of Bitcoin in the future <laughs> as the trend goes on. And that's the best fucking thing that I've ever seen in trading. And I've seen all the sophisticated option stuff. Options combos are cool. You can buy some puts or put spreads to uh, settle your brain and, and you won't miss the money in the fullness of your lifespan. You know, you'll just be happy that you stacked a convex trend futures position so that you had a lot of notional Bitcoin, and then by the time Bitcoin's 100K, it's going to be Bitcoin in your pocket, 
and you're going to be happy as fuck. And it's simple, relatively speaking. Uh, and you can, you can sauce it up. You can do it with algos. You should probably do it with algos or have a, a trailing stop uh, and then not look at it too much because it's going to be more money than you ever saw when we're over 20K and you're not going to know what to do with it. Uh, and you're going to, oh, well, maybe I should like lower, you know, and, th- and like 20K probably that's going to be like a quick move to 30K. So uh, don't be uh, a miserable little pile of secrets. Uh, use an algo to follow the trend in simple trend following type ways uh, that take away your stupidity. No offense. I'm nope. stupid too. Yep. Otherwise I'd be super rich right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? So like, take it from me, like do, do that. Uh, that's the easiest way to make a lot of money in the world in, in this time in history. Uh, I mean, when Bitcoin's uh, six figs, it's maybe a little choppier million, right? It's like a harder trade, right? But, um, but now it's, is uh, the time of the millennial Bitcoiner to ascend, to become the new power elite. Exactly. You All can of... do it. You can do it. You can become the power elite. Believe in yourself. We are, we are the new elite. Um, what about for no, like, well, not the... yet. We have to like compound some shit for a few more years. No, 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 no. We don't have to do anything. It's just gonna, it's gonna happen naturally. Um, we're just special snowflakes. Of, of yeah, yeah, capital. yeah. We're we're geniuses because we bought Bitcoin and everyone else is an idiot. Uh, we're all gonna be rich. We're geniuses. Yeah. Um, what about just for like the simple entrepreneur just trying to start his own little venture, very small hmm. scale? What about for them? For me, you know, like I'm I'm yeah, some jackass like, in his room. Okay, well, like you're a media entrepreneur, so. Uh, definitely in media, it pays to think different, right? So you're doing that. You've got a unique brand. Uh, you're differentiated. You've, you've been growing your following really well. Um, trying my best. As, as people who, yeah, people who have listened can tell that I'm rather dense. So I've churned people. <laughs> uh, I just got, I just got like a 30% boost the other uh, day because uh, Deravid uh, added me. So that was nice of them. But um, I'll probably churn out a lot of them. <laughs> but so, like, yeah, so you have a target. Trendy. So you, You've got a good asset there, and um, if only you could get a secured loan against your Twitter phone, <laughs> you could just take off. Right? Yeah. By putting it in Bitcoin, of course. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. You know. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't <laughs> put it to the podcast in any way. I'd just dump it right into Bitcoin. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of small business people in the world. And being a small business person is a fucking nightmare. Yeah. Like I did it with the food game. Yeah. And, and it was not fun, man. Um, and I've seen like my mother-in-law like try to do a small business and fail. Um, real estate is probably the best business other than Bitcoin trading. It's just that entrepreneurship is not about following your dreams. It's about what is the like highest K factor world dominating uh, economic feedback loop that I can attach myself to like, unfortunately. So like you'll get uh, out competed by sociopathic people. If you try to be like the ethics guy, but you should still be the ethics guy anyway, uh, because it's the story of your life and and you get to control that. Um, But still they'll do it. So you got to watch out for sociopaths. Um, and, and if you're in small business, you don't, but then you're just, the sociopaths are the government. They want to get the EVA or whatever, the value added tax, uh, you know, you got to you got an accounting nightmare. Like the, the time you put into accounting isn't worth it. I mean, it's a, it's hell. And everybody hates you as a small business person. Communists want to kill you. Uh, of course, like Republicans are like, oh, small business people. And then they like make a law that like fucks you and, and plays red capture to the, the big corporate incumbents. So um, don't try to be a big time entrepreneur and don't try to be a small time entrepreneur. And I guess try to be a medium sized entrepreneur and uh, or give up on it and, and follow something that has a better ROI. And don't suffer for, um, for easily uh, falsifiable hypotheses for, for too long. Oh man, you're, you're crushing dreams here. You're... Uh... Yeah, well... I mean, you know, my dreams have been crushed and then they have to rise back up. So I'm if you ask. believe in your tech vision, for example, so much that you will sacrifice seeing your child and you will sacrifice the quality of your relationship with, with your parent and you will sacrifice the quality of the relationship with your spouse and you will sacrifice your own mental health. I'm sounding like um, like Brad Pitt in uh, 
Inglorious Bastards, right? <laughs> Uh, then you will survive and you will prevail <laughs> and you will borrow every dollar and you will default on your creditors and then you will launch and then you will undefault recovery. Oh Just my give them a call. They want to hear from you. God. Um, yeah. So that's it, man. Yeah. Just be real. Don't be a little bitch. Uh, hate to use sexist terminology like that, but people know what I mean. Yeah. Um, you're doing it to yourself, man. That's my number one tip. Just you're doing it to yourself. <laughs> So, so what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Be, be cognizant of, of why uh, or, or stop. There we go. Yeah. Um, nice. I might have to put you on, like I said at the beginning of this episode, I might have to throw this on crypto is depressing, not crypto entrepreneurs, because Jesus Christ, man, I'm mentally drained here. And, uh... Oh, really? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to be more... I thought we were going to be really positive. <laughs> so um, did I. No, but it... But it's positive though, because I'm somebody who has a lot of skills. So I had to, so I, I was uh, sort of bad with my money. I'll just say that, whatever. I mean, I could have been a lot better with it. I uh, could have had, you know, a more posh buffer. And, and in my pain, I had to like triple my productivity. So I did that. And I'm still, still trying to push it like the last like 20% or so. That takes more, more training and discipline um, and practice. But I had to, I realized that I have a lot of skills. So I fell back on my skills and I found out, I, I, I figured, you know, uh, if I'm not going to kill myself, then what am I going to be doing? Well, I'm going to be doing a lot of awesome shit. So fuck it. That's great. You know? Um, I mean, I'd have a different vibe if I didn't like catch this, this job, which is a, which is a good job, you know, uh, that, that helped to get out. Cause it's a nightmare in this when you're in the spiral, you know, and the spiral, uh, cause you feel out of control. And it, it's like everything is, uh, you're, it's like you're in the big crunch, but it's like instead of the universe, it's a cash crunch. And, and you're just, you, no matter how fast you go, you can't get out of it, you know. But um, but you can't, you just need to start uh, making different decisions. And like loving yourself and loving your skills and like utilizing them for the world, for the history, man. You got to care enough about yourself to, to believe in your contribution to humanity. Oh, I'm I'm a contributing. That's uplifting. That is that is. Um, yeah, nice. Uh, <laughs> that, right, let's, let's close on that. Yeah, I was gonna say that might be where where we have to close. Um, Definitely. I, I you thank you so much for coming on. You know, you provided a lot of information, a lot of value for a lot of people. Um, I think. But also, it was funny. Yeah. No, I had I had a wonderful time. I learned a lot. I a lot of it went over my head. Uh, which I think is okay because I think there are people listening to my show who are more sophisticated than I, and uh, it'll be speaking to them a little bit more. So I'm glad that they can get some information out of this. And then we dumbed it down for you know even the you know most simple person to understand some stuff. So Patrick, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you again so much for taking the time and coming on. Yeah, I'm glad that we could do a, a Jumbo Deluxe episode about the most important protocol in the history of Bitcoin. There we go. And, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. All right, that wraps up another episode. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I just want to take a quick second to remind you to leave us a review and subscribe to the show. We would greatly appreciate it if you did. And we look forward to seeing you next episode.